This meeting is being recorded. And um, let's start with prayer. I like starting with prayer and then giving gratitude at the end to God because we, I, I really feel I need the spirit to open my, my mind and heart. And yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I just feel it's important to, to invite the Lord in our study because I know my, my mind can get fanciful <laughs> and imaginative. <laughs> Right. Would someone like to offer that prayer? Is anyone feeling the prayer vibe? I can pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you gratitude for this morning and for the opportunity to have to be reborn actually to be reborn from our sleep and to have the breath of life within us and we choose this morning to gather and um, to commune with with you to connect with you to um, connect with your heart so that we can comprehend the true meaning and intent of these words in our covenant scriptures. So we invite your spirit of truth to be among us, to teach us, to edify us, to open our hearts and our minds to your word of truth and the wisdom to know how to apply that truth within our walk today so that we may truly become your people, that we may truly become harmless and teachable and workable, and that in all our lack, but our open hearts, you may be able to make us suitable to your work, because we all desire to serve you and to especially serve and invite and help others comprehend the nature and characteristics and attributes of, of God to come unto Christ and to receive salvific ordinances. And um, so we know that we need to be prepared in all things. And I feel that this is the intent of all of our hearts and why we get up in the mornings to sit for an hour or so and read and share. And not only that, but to come closer together um, as individuals, as a community, as followers of the way, um, because relationships are so important to us. And with everything that we've been through and um, in the church, in the movement, in our communities and families, we just desire connection and to be with each other, to sit with each other, to hold each other's hearts tenderly, to become precious to one another. And we are thankful that your word draws us together and connects with the light of Christ within each of us. And we just give you gratitude for all these things and invite you to be with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Oops, I left poor Matt in the waiting room. Okay. Just wait for his audio to connect. But if someone uh, would like to start reading when his audio connects, um, Chapter uh, verse four, that would be great. Good morning, Matt. I'll go ahead and do that. Good morning. Okay. Sorry, I left you in the waiting room because I was praying and I didn't see you there. <laughs> oh, well. Good morning, Matt. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Carly. Good morning. I got time to meditate. <laughs> Good. Uh, Paul is going to read verse 
4 of Alma chapter 14. And now it came to pass that the king and those people which were converted were desirous that they might have a name, that thereby they might be distinguished from their brethren. Therefore, the king consulted with Aaron and many of their priests concerning the name that they should take upon them, that they might be distinguished. And it came to pass that they called their name anti nephi Lehi's, and they were called by this name and were no more called Lamanites. And they began to be a very industrious people, yea, and they were friendly with the Nephites. Therefore, they did open a correspondence with them, and the curse of God did no more follow them. And it came to pass that the Amlicites and the Amulonites and the Lamanites who were in the land of Amulon and also in the land of Helam and who were in the land of Jerusalem and in Fine in all the land round about who had not been converted and had not taken upon them the name of anti nephi Lehi were stirred up by the Amlicites and by the Amulonites to anger against their brethren and their hatred became exceeding sore against them, even insomuch that they began to rebel against their king, insomuch that they would not that he should be their king. Therefore, they took, a pop, took up arms against the people of Antinephi-Lehi. Now, now the king conferred the kingdom upon his son, and he called his name Antinephi-Lehi. And the king died in that self same <clears throat> self same year that the Lamanites began to make prep preparations for war against the people of God. Now when Ammon and his brethren and all those who had come up with him saw the preparations of the Lamanites to destroy their brethren, they came forth to the land of Midian and their and there Ammon met all his brethren, and from thence they came to the land of Ishmael, that they might hold a council with Lamoni, and also with his brother Antinephi-Lehi, what they should do to defend themselves against the Lamanites. Now there was not one soul among all the people who had been converted unto the Lord that would take up arms against their brethren, nay, they would not even make any preparations for war. Yea, and also their king commanded them that they should not. Thank you, Paula. Um, I feel like verses four, five, and six will make a great discussion this morning. Um, does anyone have any thoughts? What's coming to mind and heart? Um, questions, thoughts, curiosities. As you know, I've got a lot. <laughs> and I would rather hear all of you before I begin waffling, as I like oh. to call it. I do like your waffles. <laughs> I think it's waffling. as soon as the people start being converted that the the ones who used to be Nephites and who are now Lamanites um, get mad and start preparing for war against them. You know. Because yeah. they used to have the truth and they left it and so now they're mad that anybody would would choose that on purpose. Mm -hmm. And they've all been living together in these cities, um, the Amulonites, I think it was, and the, um, yeah, the Amulonites and the other ites, Amulonites, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the Lamanites. And as we talked about yesterday, the Lamanites became the more righteous among them. Um, yeah, so that is interesting that they would turn against them like that. Um, is anyone? Oh, go ahead, Paula. 
sorry, I was just thinking how the op there, you know, there's opposition in all things. It's, well, it seems like the more the people who had converted turned to the light, um, the opposition was just as equal, the, the anger and the rage against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyway. yeah, and there's some types today of that, I feel, that um, the church that we've come from, and I don't always like to, you know, point back to them because, once again, my disclaimer, I feel we are more accountable today than the LDS church, but um, those in the LDS church who don't understand at this point, anyway, are angry at those that they think are dissenters, um, mm -hmm. apostates and uh, take up arms in a way or use their authority to um, excommunicate or, or push people out and rightly so like that's they have standards for their organization of course um, but yeah a similar pattern can happen today and, and I'm sure there's many other types that fit that too Um, is anyone curious about the name? Yeah. Yes, I've been trying to remember what it means, but it's been too long ago since I heard. It's different than it sounds, right, Eva? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm hoping you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have ideas, and you know, like I never want to put a stake down because a year or so later, like I look back and I go, oh. Now I have a different understanding. <laughs> so my understanding at this point anyway um, is the importance of a name and that without a name, spiritually, we can't be identified as the Lord's people. And I remember early on um, in this movement, because we've been tracking with this movement now for 11, 12 years, and early on in the movement, I remember everyone was excited in that zeal and excitement of going to the 10 talks. Um, what do we call ourselves? Who are we? What are we now? And, you know, there were weird names like Snufferites, which was just dumb. <laughs> and then there was like the Remnant Movement, Restoration Movement, Followers of the Way. Um, I just remember so many different names because people wanted to be identified as something and um, truly in a covenant relationship with God there are names and there are titles and as a people there's even more names and titles as we know in the covenant um, and so uh, I used to think anti-Nephi Lehi was they were anti you know how we use the word today um, in opposition um, of perhaps um, having separate groups. They just wanted to be one people. Um, but I actually learned or found some ideas, let me share my screen, um, of what the name means. And it's more beautiful and meaningful. Just a second while I try and get my my stuff together. Okay. Um. There you go. Look, I made a pretty, or well, not a pretty, that's a sad picture, but I put a picture there for you. <laughs> okay. So I just put some thoughts together and, um, I titled it, What's in a Name? Um, so I looked up the word anti because I had an idea of what I thought it meant. But anti in the Hebrew means joining with someone face to face. And then anti spelt with an E in Latin, Latin is standing face to face. In Arabic, it's inda which means near to or in that place. In Egyptian, 
I can't pronounce Egyptian, but that's that right there, <laughs> N-T-Y, um, which means that which. So you could say that which is of Nephi and Lehi, or the one who is of Nephi and Lehi. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Nephi-Lehi, which I thought was interesting that it's not the Lehi-Nephi, but they put Nephi first. Um, the Nephi-Lehi part of the name, it's representing the covenant fathers of this land. And in a way, the hearts of the children turning towards their fathers in a covenantal promise relationship as children to inherit those blessings um, that were promised or covenanted to Father Lehi. And then um, Nephi, as he returns from Jerusalem with the emblems of kingship, um, the promises of Nephi. And so in a way, it's akin to saying Adam on Di um, It's a type, a similar type. So anti Nephi Lehi is a group name and it's tied to valid ordinances and authorized administrators of the covenant by adopting this name, which included both Nephi and Lehi. So there's a new king too. Um, Paulie, you read about um, the father of King Lamoni became old and he um, anointed or um, passed the torch to his son and renamed him um, Anti Nephi Lehi. That became his title. So, um, so there's a new king appointed in the land and his people implicitly recognize themselves as connected to that new king and descendants of Lehi living in the land covenant of Nephi. Um, instead of following the traditions of their more recent fathers, these people now sought to look back to the times and teachings of fathers Nephi and Lehi who had taught the true way to the tree of life and the Lord had promised all of their posterity the blessings of the covenant based on their united obedience to the laws of the coming Messiah. And so we too today, can you see the types? Like we too have been called a new name. We have an authorized administrator who has been called a new name and we can't keep the covenant separately. We need to be united as a people. Um, in the Greek, anti means against or opposite. So that was the understanding I had previously was the Greek understanding. But anti Christ in the Greek understanding is a person who pretends to be Christ or feigns being sent by Christ. They don't necessarily have to be um, voicefully opposing Christ. Um, they can feign it. In fact, an antichrist is more of a pretender. They match a Christ type by the words that they speak um, and they take Christ's place. They insert themselves um, where Christ ought to be in, in your life. Antichrist is not necessarily one who opposes Christ. Their doctrines though, the Antichrist doctrines can be Christ centric but they are an imitator and a pretender. Um, and going on, King Lamoni's father, the supreme king, gave his heir a new name or title upon his coronation, Anti Nephi Lehi. And this is akin, it's in the same pattern, of the gathering of people for the yearly festival of King Benjamin where likewise, Mosiah was coronated king. And that's at the same time, the people renewed covenant and were given a name and promises. Um, and this shows that they were keeping the law of Moses because the law of Moses centers around rites and ordinances of the temple 
bringing people together and renewing of the covenant. All the people renew covenant again yearly in what we call uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and this year it's September 29th to October 6th is the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, when the Lord enters into covenant, he will often confirm the covenant with a person or a people by giving them a new name. So that's what I found about that name. <laughs> Any thoughts? Corrections? Any corrections? So when someone receives a new name, isn't that uh, like by the Lord? Isn't that a... Um, signifying it a, a sonship or a, they become the son of God or you know what I'm saying adopted into the family of God um, something like that <laughs> I think so I think names are important as like titles and roles like if I don't know. Let's just say someone was called Enoch. I don't know. They might just go around saying, yay, I got a new name. I'm Enoch. But they're missing the point if you're just focusing on the name because it has a function. It has a role. It has a work and a labor um, to then validly be able to claim that name, I think. I see the symbolism in the, the king naming uh renaming or giving the new name to his son mm -hmm. uh, significant i think yeah so like um, go ahead no i was just just thinking of denver so him receiving a new name i don't know maybe, maybe there are others i don't know but. and so if the lord has extended covenant to us and denver wrestled the covenant um, because there, sure, there surely is a cost there to mm -hmm. obtain covenant for people. Um, and the Lord in that says that we shall become his people. You shall be my people. Doesn't He didn't say you are my people right now. To obtain that name legitimately, there's a work we need to do. There's a change within us that we need to become. And then when we become his people, I'm sure that the name will change. Um, maybe even when we have a temple, um, maybe the name will change. And so I think part of the journey is to accrue names and titles throughout the eons. Like Denver wrote a post about some of Christ's names and it's lengthy. Right. It just... And that's not even all the names. <laughs> um, so there's this progression of being added upon, um, represented by different names. And I love that anti-Nephi Lehi is extremely covenantal, extremely looking back to the fathers and how we too, through accepting the Book of Mormon as our covenant, the scriptures as our guide and standard, um, to correct ourselves and doing the labor, um, we as Gentiles can tie ourselves into the, to have Nephi and Lehi as our fathers or some of the fathers, we need to turn our hearts to, um, which then turns our hearts to Joseph of Egypt and um, that father and then um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it just goes back like that, I feel. So names are pretty important in form and function. I was uh, listening to the temple talk Denver gave in uh, October 2012, I guess, and he was talking about two procedures that he had had, one actually recently before he gave that talk, where he talks about uh, the surgeries he went through and, and 
bleeding for 40 days. And he said he, he connected the covenant to cutting and requires that kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Blood. Shedding, shedding of blood. Yeah. And uh, I thought that how significant that really is. Um, if, if we take the covenant seriously, is that also required of us? Hmm. You know, just some thoughts. Yeah, and if not um, physical cutting, then cutting open of our hearts, cutting away of um, our false unbeliefs, discarding them, cutting them away. Um, having the Lord and accepting the Lord's chastening and cutting rod of correction in a way. Um, pruning. Pruning. And well, yeah, I get I guess yeah, pruning away our, our dead parts, um our parts that are not bearing and growing <laughs> that will grow bitter fruit. So yeah, I think there's many levels of understanding. But yeah, truly cutting and surgeries and blood and um God can use anything, right? I think the word covenant is almost like the word cleave. It means coming mm -hmm. together, but it also means cut to cut. And the one that always sticks in my mind um, is that which passes between two pieces of flesh, which then, you know, that brings up all kinds of imagery with um both the garments and also this this story when they you know the people that that come and and kill them the anti uh, nephi lehi's and um yeah <laughs> that's really good for and i i love um cleave and cleave <laughs> and something coming what did you say uh something passing between it covenant um like the word cleave right can be something that's coming together and also something that's split apart mm -hmm. and covenant is similar that it means coming together but it also means to cut and um yeah so for me the um, I think if you, I think you get it from the Blue Letter Bible that it says um, that which passes between two pieces of flesh. That's it. I'm writing it down as you talk. <laughs> yeah. Now there's a there's a story in the Bible as you're saying talking about that from that I, I'm not familiar completely with, and I I think it was Abraham, but I'm not sure who had. I'm thinking of the division of the animal that was. Uh, yeah, that was Abraham. Was it Abraham? Yeah. And I'm trying to remember the story, something like he had a dream or a vision or something and, and the Lord walking between the two pieces of the animal Yeah. that was cleaved, was broken into something like that. You guys know what I'm talking about? I don't I know what you're talking about in term yeah, I remember the imagery that you're referring to. It also brings up just even what happened between Abraham and Isaac, right? Between Abraham and God, between and you can see these, um, well, particularly if we believe God is has flesh, you know, but anyway, yeah. Well, we see it again at Moses too, because we see yep. the they they have the tradition of cutting the calf in half and then at the Israelites, they were worshiping a calf. So you see a little bit of reason for the confusion of the calf because the, the calf had been, they had taken a calf and it had to be a red heifer and it had to be perfect without blemish, much like 
and now it's red because it's covered in blood. And so then they cut the thing and they divide it completely asunder and lay it filleted out. Because this is what my dad used to tell me and teach me. And he said it had to be done perfect, perfectly. And then I think you guys were just talking about something being laid on the ground. I thought it, some sort of carcass was laid out like that. I, my mind's telling me I could be wrong that there were coals or something put out on it and they walked across. I'm not sure about the coals, but. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. I'm not sure about the coals either, but it makes sense. Like, coals is pretty symbolic. <laughs> Purifying, burning, sweet savor. Purging. Mm -hmm. I think of Isaiah and the coal with the his lips. Right? Yeah. <coughs> Quite sizzling. <laughs> yeah. Diane, Colleen, any thoughts? You're right. Not at the moment. <laughs> I also um, had a thought that when we have a temple. It's akin to, um, and we gather there for the feasts and the yearly celebrations. It's akin to um, this story as well. It's akin to um, King Benjamin. Um, it actually is something that is legitimately tied to the temple where the people come with their tents or their hoopers and um, it's this festival and the king or the, the high priest stands upon a high tower which is symbolic of the temple and they renew the covenant yearly and celebrate and um there's these names and titles and um so i think we're going to see that again what it will look like i'm not sure but it seems to be like a pattern that when there's a temple and there is a temple in this land, because this is King Lamoni's father's land, which is, he's the supreme king, um, and he appoints his son in his stead. So yes, that is the place where they gather. And as we read further on, um, so in verse six, um, even Ammon and his brethren and all the others uh, probably Lamoni, remember how Lamoni had to attend um, one year the feast of his father, and he didn't because he was down having his um, throne theophany. But here they're all going up to the land to this feast where the new king is appointed and the new name is locked down and done on that group of people um, in a more formal manner. So I think we have something akin to that to look forward to. Um, we could carry on with uh, verse seven. This is part of uh, the uh, covenant. Um, who's making this covenant? I think it's the son of King Lamoni or is it Ammon? I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Um, no, I think it's the son of King Lamoni. Um, sorry, the ki the son, the anti Nephi Lehi son, the new king. Um, does someone want to carry on? We're in seven. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I was lost. I was trying to find my place. Sorry, here. I thought I'm hearing a oh. cat. I was confused. <laughs> I'm sorry. We are in Alma chapter 14 and now verse 7. Okay, yeah, that's where I thought. Now these are the words which he said unto the people concerning the matter. I thank my God, my beloved people, that our great God has in goodness sent these, our brethren, the Nephites, unto us to preach unto us and to convince us of the traditions of our wicked fathers. And behold, I thank my great God that he has given us a portion of his spirit to soften our hearts. 
that we have opened a correspondence with these brethren, the Nephites. And behold, I also thank my God that by opening this correspondence, we have been convinced of our sins and of the many murders which we have committed. And I also thank my God, yea, my great God, that he hath granted unto us that we might repent of those things, and also that he hath forgiven us of these our many sins and murders which we have committed, and took away the guilt from our hearts through the merits of his Son. And now behold, my brethren, since it has been all that we could do, as we were the most lost of all mankind, to repent of all our sins and the many murders which we have committed, and to get God to take away, take them away from our hearts. For it was all we could do to repent sufficiently before God that he would take away our, our stains. Now, my best beloved brethren, since God hath taken away our stains and our swords have become bright, then let us stain our swords no more with the blood of our brethren. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Behold, I say unto you, nay, let us retain our swords, that they be not stained with the blood of our brethren. For perhaps if we should stain our swords again, they can no more be washed bright through the blood of the Son of our great God, which shall be shed for the atonement of our sins. And the great God has had mercy on us and made these things known unto us, that we might not perish, yea, and he has made these things known unto us beforehand, because he loveth our souls as well as he loveth our children. Therefore, in his mercy, he doth visit us by his angels, that the plan of salvation might be made known unto us as well as unto future generations. Oh, how merciful is our God. And now, behold, since it has been our been as much as we could do to get our stains taken away from us and our swords are made bright let us hide them away that they may be kept bright as a testimony to our god at the last day or at the day that we shall be brought to stand before him to be judged that we have not stained our swords in the blood of our brethren since he imparted his word unto us and he has made us clean thereby and now my brethren if our brethren seek not to destroy us, behold, we will hide away our swords, yea, even we will bury them deep in the earth, that they might be kept bright as a testimony that we have never used them at the last day. And if our brethren destroy us, behold, we shall go to our God and shall be saved. Thank you, Matt. As you're reading that, I can hear. Um, it's like taking our day and the things happening in our day and overlaying it on the top. And I can hear so many similarities in even the, the covenant that we've taken upon ourselves, which is the covenants within the Book of Mormon. Um, and... Yeah, does anyone have thoughts? I have a really off the wall thought, but it came to my mind right at the end of reading that. Excuse me, there was a motorcycle driver. At the end of eight there, it says, uh, even will we uh, bury them deep in the earth that they may be kept bright as a testimony that we never use them at the last day. So they're talking about their swords, that they're burying their swords, that the swords will be kept bright. But it's funny because today when we find swords, buried in the earth they've rusted because of the iron that's in them and they've turned to red and they look like blood and so it's funny because they do they tell a testimony that they've been used to shed blood because when we find them today they look like blood hmm. so it's, i kind of find that interesting <laughs> yeah that's true so it must be a Yeah, I just lost my thought. <laughs> it Sorry, fell out. it was more of a distraction, but no, that was a good thought. I love that they're bearing them with that intent to keep the swords bright. 
um, probably, I don't know, not knowing that in our day, we would dig up swords and they would be rusted. And so there, there must be a symbolic meaning behind that. Um, They'll find the pommel or the hand grip because it was made of brass or gold or something else. And it won't be decayed, but then there'll be that bloody stain in the soil from the iron. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what did I write down? Sorry. Other things. Let's go back further. Then you're good, Matt. Sorry, does someone have a comment? I was just saying I noticed what seemed an unusual use of the word atonement, or it seemed unusual to me, but um where it said uh uh let me get back uh 14 let's see for eight um we should at the beginning if we should stain our swords again they can no more be washed bright through the blood of the son of our great god which shall be shed for the atonement of our sins for the atonement of our sins uh, I was thinking maybe reconciliation might be a way to make that work, <laughs> like just grammatically or whatever, you know. Uh, it just seems a slightly unusual use of the way they put atonement, but I haven't looked to see, you know, I'd have to go back and look at all the uses of atonement, but it stood out a little unusual. Yeah, thank you. And how they acknowledge that they have been reconciled unto Christ and that if they are to turn back to their former ways, um, they can no more be washed bright through the blood. Like that's a pretty deep understanding because um, I'm repenting all the time. <laughs> even for things that I go back to. Um... Well, I think that kind of goes back to, I think it was Melissa's comment about what happens after you've made this very sincere um, promise <laughs> between you and God and, um, and then you turn back, you know, uh, or the scripture of you know uh uh trying to plow while you're facing backwards or mm -hmm. what is it? i don't remember exactly how it goes. anyway um so even though we talked about the idea that god will continue to work with you at whatever stage or place you are at and whatever understanding you have um that also brings back and I think Carleen mentioned this too was you know when you were in the temple in the LDS temple for instance if you know you were making signs that were maybe perhaps a little scary you know and and did indicate this um, cutting of the covenant and and so there is certainly something to be said for you know if you say yes then make sure you are ready <laughs> ready to say yes i guess i i think i think that we are in the preliminary of the the i think more serious covenant um i re recalling in the Zion talk, how he was telling the story of um, Ananias and Sophia, his wife. Um, he says, "This is, you know, this is what happens when you actually take a, a serious." I think it was more of the the covenant that has to do with Zion, and what happens if you. You know, um, you know how they uh, lied to Peter, and they uh, both die. Okay, 
And I think at this point we're, I, I, I know we're in a serious covenant, but I don't know that it's that covenant that if we do something like lying, <laughs> it would actually cost our lives. I, Mm -hmm. I think it, I think the Lord is working with us because we're we're still trying to come out of Babylon and <laughs> we got a lot of stuff to root out of us to, before we can get to that really serious. I think that's just my thought. Before we get to that covenant, that would require our lives, our our you know, blood to be shed if we break it you know mm -hmm. yeah as you're uh, saying all that Paula for me this is just my own perception for my own journey um, is that we're in a like you said a preliminary stage and yes it is important um, how we behave and speak and what we do and think um, but as it's been said we haven't kept the covenant none of us have yet because I mean we're imitating it we're hoping to we're going little by little I think it's more of a self-correction and learning to walk together but and for me in my understanding when we have a temple and whoever the high priest is whether it's Denver or someone else who will officiate in maybe this yearly renewal of the covenant festival um, and the Lord comes to the temple, that then to me is Zion. The mm -hmm. Lord brings Zion. And it's a whole new, deeper level of um, commitment to the covenant. And um, I, I think it was mentioned before that um, at that time, you can't feign it. Um, and I think that story you brought up was, um, and we are our own judges. I think the temple is really important for the fact that you're right. We, we haven't yet been able to keep the covenant as a people, but I think the temple and the things I was listening to <clears throat> will teach us to be that new civilization it will be the education that we need as a people mm -hmm. to be a zion people so i think that it is actually we should be really pleading for that temple i think <laughs> to show us so that we can be taught um, a new way of living i guess right like like the nephites after christ uh came to them learned had to learn to be a new civilization a new people and that took three levels right right and because we are still in some way wild animals you know those badges that put up a hell of a fight and you don't want to use badger skin says denver <laughs> um and so we are still uh animalistic and so in a way we've been us to lay down our weapons of war in today's understanding um, to lay down our weapons of rebellion and as we talked about yesterday um, and even uh, King Anti Nephi Lehi he says to them in this uh, beginning covenant that they were the worst of all um, the traditions of their wicked fathers made them the worst of all. And I remember it being said in one of the talks that those who hold on to the restoration are the worst of all. <laughs> um, because probably of what it has become, but now there's been God in his mercy, as anti-Nephi, Lehi is saying, that God in his mercy upon us made the truth known unto us that we might not perish and has made these things known unto us beforehand because he loveth our souls as well as he loveth our children. Therefore, in his mercy, he has, my own paraphrase, he has visited us by angels that the plan of salvation 
might be known unto us and future generations. And that's what an, a true messenger does, like Joseph Smith uh, and I'll say Denver. They are angels, they are sent ones, and they lay out correct faith so that we can have correct faith. They lay out the truth. They lay out the plan of salvation, not only for us, but future generations. And that is also represented in this new scriptures that we have, um, how important they are to our future generations. And so we too can exclaim how merciful is our God. Um, and I think this covenant, like you mentioned, Paula, is like a Zion covenant. It's a group covenant. It's a people covenant, which is what we have too. And we need to become a people and if we fail, well, redemption is still possible, um, individual, but the opportunity for Zion and a new civilization is lost. Same with Cain. Um, there are accounts that he repented all his life for what he had done with Abel, and God still talked to him. And at some point, um, you know, he was redeemed, forgiven of that, but he lost an opportunity he lost a lot um so we have today a covenant akin to this a zion potential zion covenant especially whenever there's a zion covenant there's a temple um so it's all tied in together um we could read one more verse You want me to read, Eva? Thank you, Colleen. Is it verse nine that we're on? Mm. Um, I think so. Yeah. Okay. And now it came to pass that when the king had made an end of these sayings, and all the people were assembled together, they took their swords and all the weapons which were used for the shedding of man's blood, and they did bury them up deep in the earth. And this they did, it being, in their view, a testimony to God and also to men that they never would use weapons again for the shedding of man's blood. And this they did, vouching and covenanting with God that rather than shed the blood of their brethren, they would give up their own lives. And rather than take away from a brother, they would give unto him and rather than spend their days in idleness they would labor abundantly with their hands and thus we see that when these Lamanites were brought to believe and to know the truth they were firm and would suffer even unto death rather than commit sin and thus we see that they buried the weapons of buried the weapons of peace or they buried the weapons of war for peace I have uh, thoughts in this verse of how we don't necessarily have weapons today that we're hacking and chopping each other with, but we do have those weapons of rebellion and our tongues can be the greatest weapon that wounds. Our actions can be a, a weapon that... Um, yeah, I was thinking you said we don't have weapons, but I want to agree with you. But I also want to say controversially, I think our pens and our words are our weapons today. I think mm -hmm. the biggest problem we have right now as the people is the the way we're using our words about each other, talking to each other, or talking about each other behind our backs. It's it's a hard, hard problem for us to overcome as a people is is trusting each other, relying that if the Lord's going to talk to somebody, they're going to be just like us. And so to keep mm -hmm. thinking we're special, you're, you're unique. And I'm sorry I interrupted you, Eva. I just wanted to point out those two that, anyways. Yeah, I agree. Like we can kill another with our words, like kill another's faith, break another's heart to the point where, um, they don't want anything to do with the covenant or becoming a people because 
of the wounds that come and those sores that fester. So I totally agree with you. And so can we bury those weapons today um, as a witness before the Father? It sounds like the doctrine of Christ to me um, and how after talk 10, uh, we were invited to all go down and get rebaptized to acknowledge the Lord's work underway. And that baptism is the witness or a testimony before the Father. Um, I just have a question. Um, yeah. Back to what Matt was saying. Um, do you think we have to get to a point where we don't allow the words to hurt us? Um, in order to become a people that works together and, and we we look past their words and into their hearts or we forgive whatever is in their heart. I don't know. I mean, we have to get... Everybody uses words sometimes incorrectly and, it, and it's not what they're, they're feeling in their heart. Sometimes they use words and that's what they're feeling in their heart. But don't... I kind of think we have to get to that point where we don't let the words offend us or or change the love we have for others. Amen. Um, Amen. You know, Amen. So, a thousand times. I remember boot camp. When we first got there, you could say a word and so easily offend that guy in your bunk. Oh, what are you saying to me? Oh, you know, and that, that word was a fighting word. Now, after fast forward 90 days and after we've suffered and been through the bad weather together and starved together and had some rejoicing together now that same word is a brotherhood word amongst us you know it's like now what was a curse word before that was a fighting word we're now using as, a, as and sharing and like oh yeah that's just slang and so it's it's funny how i keep thinking that I under, in a way, I understand the when the Lord talks about the tribulations and things coming, because if you have stubborn children, sometimes hardships will soften their hearts. And so if we're sitting here stuck being hard hearted, guess what? We're about to be softened. <laughs> and the prunings or the other things, the other terminologies, we're going to experience that until in the Marine Corps, we had a saying, the, be the beatings will continue until the morale improves. <laughs> so it's like, you're going to enjoy this. <laughs> I, on, on the flip side, I what keeps coming to my mind, sure, um, people might say things that may sting, but let, let's turn this around and, and think about what the Lord had told us, that if, if we're taking what he said seriously in his answer to us is that we need to measure our words carefully and consider the hearts of others. So uh, be slow to speak and, and maybe as a people learning to stop and think, is this was, is what that's coming out of my mouth? Is that going to of how is that going to affect somebody else and, and not be hasty in what we say? And, but, you know, I think there's always going to be a moment of, as we're learning, that we might actually accidentally say something to, and it will hurt somebody, but will we be aware of what we say and go, you know, and, and immediately be able to, I apologize, you know, or, you know, um, Really, I think it's that self-awareness and everything we say and do is it's going to be carefully measured. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's why it's, it I'm makes it put it. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that that's why, see, it puts us, puts both of those ideas, put it back in our own lap mm -hmm. on one side. We do measure our words, hopefully. Um, of course, I'm guilty of maybe not doing that sometimes. And on the other side, we always forgive in every circumstance. And so it's never outside. We are never controlled by another's words in that way. 
we are accountable for our own words and we are also forgiving of others what we might perceive as their errors or whatever and it makes it whole it's a whole being you know what Carleen said and what you just said Paula and it's it creates the whole of how you can respond in the world thank you Fawn agreed I think you know I think both ideas are important and I think that um, for me, as I've gotten to know people better and um, understood more of who they are and um, their heart, that things that, you know, things that they say that <clears throat> that might have bothered me in the past, I am able to take that and say, well, you know, it's true. <laughs> and um, they're coming from a good place. And so, you know, not be hurt by that or not be offended by that, but know that they have a point, you know, and I should consider that, you know. And, and at the same time, trying to be with the things that I say, always being honest and, um, and thinking also about, is that really important for me to, to tell them? Probably not, you know, I'll, you know, and I've learned in my relationship with my husband anyway, if there's something that he's doing that's just driving me crazy, or if there's um, if there's something that I really, really want to do that's really important to me and he's not supportive of it, it's much more effective for me to complain to God than to complain to him and let God change his mind. <laughs> you know, I I let God change his heart and and if it's important, um, then God will change his heart. And if it's not important, then I let it go. <laughs> it reminds me of, of Denver talking about what the people, I think he was referencing the people in Zion, well, take up any of uh, issues with the Lord instead of with each other. As you were talking, Diana, it's, it's our complaints will go to the Lord and he can, I guess, help us see it for what it is, maybe. Yeah. I have a thought to add that um, as you're all talking and sharing and sharing these, um, this growth that you've all experienced in your life of self-awareness and being open to what really matters and correction and contemplating rebukes from other people like that's beautiful that is growth and openness um i also heard in my mind the words of the lord where he says if um if men mean no offense i take no offense or something like that mm -hmm. and i have been in relationships where offense has been intended uh to the point of witch hunts and I'll just leave it at that. And even recently, like in relationships where offense has been intended, and this has been between covenant brothers and sisters, and sure, there is no need for them to come and say, will you forgive me? It's automatically given, but I'm sure as hell going to have boundaries. <laughs> I'm not going to force myself upon that person for the sake of, we got to have relationship. <laughs> It's unhealthy. It's bad for my mental health. It's bad for them if I'm triggering them. So I, I feel it's important to let people go in peace when a relationship will not work out and it is becoming toxic or detriment, detrimental to your own peace. And But holding in your hope, your heart, the hope of reconciliation when we both go off and do our own inner work and... Um, receive correction from the Lord. So that's my hope with 
you know, some people where words cannot be spoken together. Um, but it is a matter of heart. That's one of the things we talked about yesterday that can remain pure is the intent of our heart. Um, it was truth, God's love, and the intent of the heart are the three things that can remain pure. So um, I think naturally we gravitate to people that we resonate with, that we feel a kinship with. And sometimes we bind ourselves with pairs and sometimes we become wheat I found that often I've gone back and forth between those I don't think God is just like gathering people going okay now we go you have to lump it all out and work it out I think we have this time to see who our tribe is and um, let everyone else go off and find their tribe too and so among this group among people that I feel kinship with there's a love here there's a love and I'm more keen to go, well, you know, Matt or Diane or Paula or Fawn or Colleen, um, they didn't mean any offence. They love me. And so I, I can, I like, not get my hackles up so quickly because in this relationship it's proven that you have my best interest at heart. And so I welcome correction and welcome whatever it is. So that was just my thoughts. All good thoughts. They're good thoughts. I like them. <laughs> Everyone had a good point. I love what Matt said about the, oh, I don't know, I can't remember what you quoted, Matt, but it's something, you know, you'll you'll get beat till you're all together. <laughs> How did you say that, Matt? About the Marines? Uh oh, it was, we were always told that um, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway. And another phrase that we used that I find in a way like this, but it's just kind of, it was embrace the suck. And so we have to learn to some of those things that are just <laughs> awful that, you know, change your attitude and, and learn to be a kid out there in his galoshes, trudging in the mud instead of being unhappy about, you know, carrying a pack, marching along the sea. You know, it's just, you got to reach down deep inside and change something but i also want to apologize because i realized that i i grew up in the family and we all kind of talked at once and sometimes we'd get louder and talk over each other and so i have a tendency to bulldoze and i also need to ask how in the heck do we raise our hand because i'm sitting here and looking along the bottom at all these little icons and i'm like okay i'm a bully Oh my goodness, Matt! I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. I, I didn't feel you over talked over. I didn't. I don't feel you over talked over anyone. No, you're <laughs> fine. So if you go to reactions down the bottom, I have a smiley face with a plus sign. Mm -hmm. um, in the reactions, there's emojis you can share. You know, like a oh, laugh. Oh, raise hand. I sound like I see clap hand and thumb hand, but those aren't the raise hand, and it says raise hand at the bottom. It's like if your if your bifocals aren't just right, there's little things you just completely miss. It's funny. I don't see that, Ela. I don't see that at all on mine. All right, let me share my screen. Um, oh, I, is it a round face? Oh, yes. I see it. Okay, oh. I see it now. I didn't do that. I didn't share my screen. Yeah, they're just. Okay. Do you want us to raise our hand, Eva? Oh, my, you can do whatever you want to do. This, <laughs> You know, if people are talking and you have a comment to say and you don't want to interrupt them, sure, go ahead or just, I'm fine with whatever. I'm not in charge. <laughs> I just waffle a lot. <laughs> waffle with syrup. <laughs> so let's pray together. Um, Although, Diane, did you have a comment you wanted to share? Okay. I thought I saw her before have a comment. Yeah, um, I, have to, I have to take take the baby to go get diaper changed. Okay. So. Well, we'd... Um, Anyone like to offer our 
prayer this morning. I can do it, but I said the opening prayer. <laughs> All right, I'll say it. <laughs> Not very good with words, but I'll say it. <laughs> Not about words. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. The close of our study session and gathering together and discussing um, thank you heavenly father for this opportunity to connect with one another as brothers and sisters and even those who listen to the recordings that, uh, they may feel that connection as well um grateful for the opportunity to learn and to understand um, these sacred words that teach about ourselves and, and the kind of people that you would like us to become. Uh, thank you for spirit being poured out upon us and, and opportunities to be taught through your spirit these truths. We are grateful for your servant that you have sent who has opened up so much uh, an understanding faith and repentance and understanding who you are. Um, grateful. We ask that thou will be with each of us through the remainder of this day. That we may feel you walking with us th through the good and the bad. Praying for all those who are in need of blessings, particular blessings, healing and comfort and whatever they're struggling with here in, in this group and, and on that list that Eva has. There are so many people going through trials and afflictions. I think we all are facing them grateful for this refining process and please forgive us for our sins and help us to recognize the things that we need to change in our hearts that we may be called your sons and daughters someday we pray that the temple <laughs> We might be able to see that day. We love you, Father. We love your Son who has atoned for us. Thank you for that sacrifice. And I'd like to open it up for anyone else who might want to say something. If not, uh, we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Paula. Amen. I was going to add, which I took too long, <laughs> that I, I plead to the Lord to help us figure out what our weapons of war are, our weapons of rebellion, and how uh, we can be more self-aware and, and become harmless. 
There we go. I add that. Okay. <laughs> the addendum to the prayer. <laughs> um, prayer. Thank you. Would anyone like to uh, have sacrament tomorrow? Yeah, that would be lovely. Like we did a few weeks ago. Uh, we don't have to get up as early, but we could do like, I forget what time we did last time. I thought it was, a, I don't know, nine or 10. Wasn't eight or nine. Kind of moderate. It was good. Okay. I mean, if we want to, we can do it in the evening or um, there's no, um, maybe Colleen and Paula and Fawn would like to do sacrament together. I'm just assuming. Yeah, I would. That would be nice. I think I, I'd rather. Rather, I'd rather do it earlier in the day than late in the evening. Saturdays get kind of hectic, but that's just my thinking. How about you, Paul? Um, if we do it early, could I mean, I, I could probably do it about, for me, it'd be seven in the morning. Yeah, it might be eight o'clock for you guys. I don't know if that's too early, <laughs> but um, I'm open to that. Yeah. I was like to join us. Who did, what did you say? Oh, Fawn, would you like to join oh. us? Oh, I'll probably abstain. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Carleen, does that uh, work for you? Um, I don't know about seven in the morning. Um, are you, you on the, are it? you on Pacific time, Carleen, or are you on? I'm on, uh, right now it's 7.30ish. Right now, so, uh, 7 30. So I, what I'm proposing is, because I'm on Pacific time, so I would be at 7 o'clock for me, so would 8 o'clock or 8.30 be okay for you guys? You, yeah, you 8 o'clock, yeah. whose time? Our time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mountain time. Not, yeah, mountain time. It, it, yeah, it's fine. Does that, does that work? I mean, I if that, that doesn't mm -hmm. work, then we you can pick a different time. No, it, it, it's Eva, is Andrew going to do the sacrament? Mm, he can, yeah, he'll be here. Oh, or what, I was just, are you going to use the recording? I don't, I just wondered about your schedule. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew will be here, so he can do it. And for oh, your welcome to join us, and we just, we can discuss anything that everyone's studying or... Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I probably won't for the okay. for the weekend. Thank you. No worries. Yeah. All right. Well, I um, think... go ahead, Colleen. Sorry. No, I just um, yeah. No, I it'd be I should be able to be there. You know, okay. At eight o'clock tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're talking. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that okay? I mean, uh huh. Yeah. Sounds we'll doable. Do mm -hmm. And it's if doable. whoever shows up shows up. It doesn't matter. There's you know, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good day. See have you a great tomorrow. Day. Bye bye. All right. Thanks bye. everyone. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye.